It has been announced that supporters group Hammers United intend to stage a static protest prior to West Ham United's next home Premier League fixture against Everton on the 18th of January. According to Representative Paul Colborne speaking in a video released on behalf of Hammers United, the group intend to protest as a result of the board having failed to deliver upon a 10-point plan announced shortly after they took control of the club back in 2010. This protest is about the board. It's about the board and nothing but the board, he said. The date is highly significant as Messrs Gold and Sullivan took power on the 19th of January 2010 and would have been in power for exactly 10 years. We protest to hold them to account for their failure over 10 years and the failure of their 10-point plan and the disastrous move from Upton Park to the new stadium, a move that's seen thousands of West Ham supporters fall by the wayside. The 10-point plan was announced shortly after David Sullivan and David Gold purchased a majority share of the club in January 2010, 10 years ago this month. But our Hammers United rights suggest that the board have failed to deliver. Let's examine the 10 aims as published back in 2010, one by one. Point one, to appoint a new high-calibre manager. At the end of the 2009-10 season, the board fired Gianfranco Zola, who had kept West Ham in the Premier League in favour of Avram Grant, who promptly relegated the club. West Ham finished bottom of the table following Sullivan and Gold's first full season in the ballroom, and it was no surprise when he was swiftly replaced by Sam Allardyce. Big Sam's tenure came to an end at the culmination of his four-year contract, whereupon Slaven Bilic became West Ham United's 16th full-time manager. Within two years... Billich had gone, to be replaced on a temporary basis by the out-of-work David Moyes. When Moyes was considered to be surplus to requirements, co-chairman Sullivan stating at the time that, having taken stock of the situation and reflected now the campaign is complete, we feel that it is right to move in a different direction, Manuel Pellegrini was hired. However, the Chilean, who was dragged back to England from a lucrative contract in China, proved to be an ill fit for West Ham and, like all those before him bar Allardyce, was outed less than two years after being handed the managerial reins by the current administration. With Pellegrini paid off, the club turned to Moyes once again, despite the former Everton manager not being considered good enough to be offered a permanent contract in 2018. When Grant was hired, he had just taken Chelsea to a Champions League final. Allardyce was considered by many as a necessary appointment, given the club's perilous situation, having been relegated under the Israeli, whilst Bilic, a former player, had previous management experience at international level with Croatia. Six years before he was hired by West Ham, Pellegrini had won the Premier League title with Manchester City, before being outed by Pep Guardiola. So it could be argued that the managers appointed had indeed been of a high calibre even though it could just as easily be argued that few, if any, had been given the necessary backing by the board in the transfer market or in the media to succeed in their roles, an argument backed up by the short spells each bar Allardyce enjoyed. Verdict? Pass. Point two, to sign new players hungry to do well. It could be argued that Sullivan and Gold took this point rather too literally when signing Benny McCarthy during their first year at West Ham, the South African forward being vastly overweight and unfit, both physically and for purpose. A glance back at the players purchased during the last decade shows a shocking disregard for continuity or any semblance of a coherent strategy. There are few who were purchased and later sold for reasonable profit, the most notable of those being Dimitri Payet, the outstanding purchase of the last 10 years, and a player who realised a profit of nearly £20 million. A quick glance at their transfer record highlights a steady stream of mostly unremarkable players. Your Hitzelspergers, Meigers, Nordweitz and Downings, ageing former stars, the Arbeloas, Borriellos and Everas, and those complete punts. Think George John, Wellington Paulista and Jonathan Caleri. Prior to the anti-ball demonstration during the Burnley match in March 2018, only one player, Andre Ayew, had attracted a transfer fee in excess of £20 million, since when the club's transfer record has been broken four times. Of course, the hungry tag is essentially meaningless, so in order to assess whether or not the board can claim to have achieved a successful transfer record while signing ambitious players really needs to be judged on their performance as a whole. More than 170 players have been signed on Sullivan and Gold's watch, yet the only player from the top 10 most expensive signings to have won a Player of the Year award is Marko Arnautovic whose stay at the club was brief. Additionally, the decision to halt the flow of funding to the club's academy that Sullivan once told KUMB costs in the region of £3.5 million per year to support has minimised the graduation of homegrown players. 
However, the policy of taking punts on academy stars from other clubs, such as Nathan Holland, Martin Samuelson and Declan Rice, has paid off via the catcher of the latter alone, who is currently valued anywhere between £50 and £75 million. Pounds. Verdict? Fail. Point three, to further invest in the academy. As referred to towards the end of the previous summary, the academy has taken a major hit under Sullivan and Gold, with funding having been minimised in recent seasons. Tony Carr, the former doyen of academy directors, was shambolically treated when removed from his position after having his contract details splashed across social media by one of Sullivan's sons. The co-chairman later supported his decision to part company with Carr by accusing him of having failed to produce any first-team players since the emergence of James Tompkins, conveniently forgetting the likes of Junior Stanislas, Freddie Sears and others who more than paid for their development in respect of ensuing transfer fees when sold on. Carr, who was partly responsible for the club's golden era of producing young stars such as Joe Cole and Rio Ferdinand in the late 1990s, was succeeded by Terry Wesley, who worked with players such as George Monker and Danny Potts, not forgetting his own son Sam, which led to charges of nepotism. However, his only major success was Declan Rice, who only came to West Ham after he was released by Chelsea. At one stage, the academy was being funded by donations from sponsors and one-off cup competitions. Such was the apparent disdain in which it was held by Sullivan in gold. And it wasn't until 2019 that the academy's Chadwell Heath HQ received much-needed refurbishment, although it has been argued that the £4 million spent was wildly insufficient. While Declan Rice's eventual sale could effectively fund the academy for the next decade or more, it cannot be argued that Sullivan and Gold have treated the club's once famous academy with a certain degree of contempt, and it cannot be argued that it remains underfunded in relation to West Ham's competitors, both domestically and abroad. Verdict? Fail. Point four, to further reduce club debt. This is the easiest point to answer. Unequivocally, the debt has, without question, been reduced from the £100 million plus level it stood at when the club was purchased back in 2010. Yet there is more to this than meets the eye and certain aspects that cannot be ignored. Sullivan and Gold, in moving the club's outstanding debt from the banks to themselves, has absolutely worked in their favour, given their policy to charge 4% interest. That figure used to be 7% until the fans expressed uproar at the policy. Even still, the co-chairman charged the club in the region of £16 million in interest payments during the last financial year, for which details are publicly available, according to the club's most recently published accounts. For some reason, Sullivan chose to be economical with the truth when pressed about the interest rates charge during an exclusive interview with KUMB.com back in 2013. Responding to a question asking whether his and Gold's loan was interest-free, he stated, and I quote, We're not allowed to, but it's rolled up interest and there's no pressure to pay. Closer scrutiny proved this claim to be entirely false. Mike Ashley, who is hated by fans of Newcastle United, has provided more than £100 million worth of loans to the Magpies, interest-free, as of other prominent figures at clubs such as Everton. Verdict? Pass. Point five, to free season ticket prices with further member benefits promised. Early on in their reign, Sullivan, Gold and Karen Brady attempted to renege on promises made by the previous administration of Duxbury and Strauma regarding season tickets. A 20% discount was only granted following an outburst on KUMB and other sites, whilst a decision to double the cost of disabled fans' season tickets was also reviewed and eventually halved following a similar storm. Season ticket prices were cut by 10% ahead of the 2011-12 season, although it should be noted that the club were playing in the second tier at that stage following relegation from the Premier League. At that point, adult season tickets started at £515. Upon promotion, they were increased again, but only to 2010-11 levels. The following season, 2013-14, they matched the rate of inflation, 2.8% for those renewing, although new applicants would pay an 8% increase. The next year, 2014-15, prices were again frozen as a special thank you to our loyal fans, according to a statement from the co-owners. A 5% increase ensued for the final season at the bowling ground in 2015-16, as demand unsurprisingly outstripped supply. But it was for the first season in Stratford that a policy of affordable football was introduced, with season tickets, admittedly in the upper reaches of the Olympic Stadium, being made available for as little as £250, or £99 for under-16s. A low those sitting in the lower tiers saw their season ticket prices increased, much was made of affordable football, and it cannot be argued that this didn't prove to be a hugely successful policy, with the club finding thousands of new season ticket holders, many of whom remain today. 
What is often overlooked, however, is that many of those who were season ticket holders for years, sometimes decades at the old ground, failed to follow the club to Stratford. And a further 6,000 season ticket holders on average per season have since failed to renew. Verdict, pass. Point six, to build the status and image of the club, both domestically and further afield. Despite doubling the number of season tickets and footprint of the club stadium, it can be argued the status of the club has barely changed since 2010. In purely football terms, when Sullivan and Gold first purchased their majority share, West Ham United FC lay on the cusp of the relegation zone, pretty much where it is now a decade later, with no significant improvement noted. And more on that later. The rebranding of the club's badge was meant to herald a new era, but only served to cause friction amongst those who held the club's traditions and heritage in great regard. The addition of London to the club crest was pretty much universally panned and the image of West Ham London is considered to be less potent than West Ham United. You're not West Ham anymore is frequently chanted by supporters of visiting teams. West Ham, in percentage terms in comparison to their competitors, can count on barely any more support in growing football territories such as China, the Far East and North America. Tours to places such as these have not made any significant impact in the depth of support worldwide, and bursts of growth in places such as Israel and Mexico ended as soon as players such as Ayo Berkovic and Javier Hernandez moved on. Karen Brady, the brains behind West Ham's marketing operation in the last decade, may sit in the House of Lords and be one of the in-house business moguls on TV's The Apprentice. But there is little evidence at West Ham to show that she has delivered any great improvement to the club's image during her tenure. Verdict, fail. Point seven, to make the football enjoyable, including changes to pre-match and half-time entertainment. The changes to pre-match and half-time entertainment largely focused on a desire to bring back the hammerettes during the early years of Golden Sullivan's reign, although there were no great improvements in the fare offered at the bowling ground between 2010 and 2016. Now, of course, there are far more options available to supporters in terms of food outlets, varieties of beverages and local shops in Westfield since the move to Stratford. But here's the thing. That West Ham are currently battling against relegation, having recently been forced to sack the previous manager for abject failure after having achieved just one top flight finish above 10th place in the last 10 seasons, following one relegation, several near misses and one pitch invasion in protest at the quality of football, suggests that Hammers fans remain as frustrated as ever at the club's inability to resemble a genuine footballing force domestically. And let's not forget that in more than 25 years of football administration, Sullivan, Gold and Brady are yet to deliver a single major trophy to either Birmingham or West Ham fans. There have of course been sparks and hints that a general improvement is coming. Many fans consider the 2015-16 season as one of their most enjoyable campaigns ever. But one swallow does not a summer make, and one outstanding or successful season in 10 doesn't really cut the mustard, especially when we were all sold the Stratford dream. West Ham remain no closer to breaking into the upper echelons of English clubs as they ever have, or at least since the glory years of the 1960s and 1970s, when the Irons featured in seven major finals within 16 years. Verdict? Fail. Point eight. To ensure closer ties with the local community, both inside and outside of football. West Ham's ties with the local community have always been well regarded, and it's fair to say that this has been continued under Sullivan and Gold's reign. Schemes such as Any Old Irons and the work carried out via the West Ham Foundation have delivered real change and lasting benefits to the lives of East End folk. Meanwhile, all first team players are contracted to undergo community work on behalf of the club, although this is standard policy for most professional clubs. That aside, it is heartwarming to read of players visiting local hospices and care homes and supporting local causes and charities. David Sullivan too has also donated considerable sums to charity appeals and really seeks recognition for this. David Gold regularly opens his home to the public in order to raise funds for charitable concerns. However, the club have also been accused of forgetting supporters, many of whom still reside in the local community, that failed to renew their season tickets in the years since leaving Upton Park. Hammers United estimate that up to 20,000 long-standing fans have fallen by the wayside. Verdict? Pass. Point nine. To build towards a move to the Olympic Stadium. Again, there are no arguments here. The board had clearly outlined moving from Upton Park to Stratford as one of their key strategies upon purchasing the club. Was there any other reason for buying it? And succeeded in this. And here we are today, for better or for worse. 
The move has allowed West Ham to increase their stadium capacity to 60,000 to become one of the biggest in England. But the benefits of this have been minimal in terms of finances and reputation. The move is said by David Sullivan himself to have elevated the club's annual income by no more than £2 million per season. That's less than six months' wages for a top-earning player. The club essentially pays a peppercorn rate, just £2.7 million per annum, to use the stadium. But West Ham cannot use the stadium outside of the allotted 20 days per year without the permission of the owners and have little to no say in its internal design. The protracted arguments over the installation of a claret carpet being testament to this. West Ham's image also suffered hugely following the stadium move, with the club being labelled Taxpayers FC by some, as the OS operates at huge cost to the public purse. United's contribution barely scratches the surface. And the ground is hated by many fans who dislike the design intensely and the enormous distance between the stands and the pitch. David Gold's pre-Stratford insistence that he would not entertain a move unless the stands were as close to the pitch, as was the case at the bowling ground, is regularly used as a stick with which to beat him. And Karen Brady's ambition of a world-class team playing in a world-class stadium looks every bit the false carrot dangled over the noses of supporters that it probably was. The vast space between pitch and stands, which is partly covered by carpet, has served to destroy any hope of generating an effective atmosphere inside the stadium, which, given the close proximity of the stands to the pitch at the bowling ground, has only been intensified. Visiting fans, shunted behind the goal and up in the gods, routinely pan the stadium's layout, then complain about the journey from stadium to station, which is frequently interrupted by stewards with stop signs. However, the stadium is not without its positive aspects. International visitors can travel to Stratford directly from main European cities. Westfield is a nice diversion, even though its presence appears to have prevented any more home games being staged on Boxing Day. And the stadium is aesthetically pleasing, cleaner and offers more in terms of variety as far as consumables are concerned. And many fans prefer the stadium and Olympic Park to the bowling ground and Green Street. That said, the club has a long way to go yet in order to convince the entire fan base that the move has had a positive effect on the club. Verdict, fail. Point 10. Listen to the supporters. The final point, almost certainly the biggest failing of all, and the main reason why the board now find themselves at odds with much of the fan base and preparing to face a protest. In order to satisfy Premier League requirements, Karen Brady launched the Supporters Advisory Board, the SAB, prior to the move to Stratford, a group in which supporters were invited to represent their fellow fans. However, it soon became clear that this was little more than a box-ticking exercise. Insisting that attendees left their mobile phones and any other potential recording devices at the door, and forcing group members to sign non-disclosure agreements in order to avoid being denied entry, made a mockery of what was initially marketed as an open platform on which the club could liaise with its own fans. When the SAB folded in the wake of heavy criticism, the club turned to independent content creators to provide fans feedback. KUMB were present for all of these meetings, as were other prominent groups and media organisations. However, this kind of representation ended following meetings in February 2018, in which the club negotiated the cancellation of a planned protest, which was to be led by the now defunct Real West Ham Fans Action Group. Numerous promises, or pledges, were made. Few have been fulfilled. In 2018, a replacement for the SAB, the Official Supporters Board, the OSB, was announced. Yet, like the SAB, this was similarly derided and charged with being undemocratic, with the members elected by a cabal of the board's close confidence. Further, the club refused to deal with any of the club's independent content providers, a complete 180-degree turn from their previous stance. In 2017, the editor of KUMB.com, the only independent West Ham-based media organisation that employs full-time staff, was banned from attending media events at the club, having previously enjoyed access since 2004. The reason given for this by media officer Ben Campbell was that KUMB were responsible for publishing unnecessarily negative content. We called it the truth. The club also cancelled a long-standing advertising contract with Knees Up Mother Brown, another consequence of the website failing to tow the company line and failed attempt to limit KUMB's influence in West Ham circles. In the last 12 months, despite repeated attempts to gain an audience with the board, Hammers United have been told the only way this could happen is if they accept an offer to join the OSB. However, the OSB has proved to be a toothless organisation whose only notable achievement since its inauguration has been to delay the season ticket renewal date by two weeks. Verdict? Fail. So in summary, it is fair to say that the board have succeeded on some levels, 
Yet it is equally viable to suggest that they have failed in a number of key areas and may be responsible for what amounts to serious corporate mismanagement. This has led us to a position whereby a sizable group of supporters, several thousand strong and under the Hammers United banner, feel it is an appropriate time to stage a visible protest against their stewardship of West Ham United FC and the perceived lack of progress both on and off the pitch. Upon reflection, it seems the board have been the architects of many of their own problems. The falsehoods told prior to the move to Stratford, the lack of coherent transfer policy, the dismissive attitude towards thousands of loyal and long-standing supporters, the creation of non-independent supporter groups, the stubborn refusal to liaise with independent supporter representatives unless they can control the narrative, all wholly avoidable actions for which they will now be held to account. And so we begin the new year the board's second decade in control of this famous and beloved institution of ours, with the club's administrators preparing to go to war with their own fans. And it really didn't have to be like this. It still doesn't.